Texas power grid failure. How did a once in a lifetime winter storm turn into complete and total systemic collapse for Texas? In today's video, we're gonna be answering that question and we're gonna be looking at what are some of the key lessons learned and key takeaways for preppers about how a total loss of infrastructure should influence and impact our household preparedness plans. Hi everyone, Joe Ordia here for Solar Surge. And for the past eight years, I've been helping families get their home set up to survive a loss of the electric grid. Now, if you're new to the channel, on Solar Surge, we talk about all things related to uh, energy independence, self-sufficiency, emergency prepping, and survival. And in today's video, we're gonna be taking another look at Texas and some of the lessons learned here for preppers. Now, as, as you may imagine, uh, in the, the week or two following the Texas power grid outage, we received a lot of inquiries from Texans inquiring about what they can do to protect their homes uh, from another loss of the electric grid. And what I came to find out was that the events in Texas went way beyond just a power grid failure. Uh, in fact, the power outage was really just the first domino to fall in a sequence of events that ultimately led to a complete failure of infrastructure. And I want to jump into some of those uh, events now and really dig into it and, and what are the, the key lessons learned so that we can help strengthen our household emergency preparedness plan. Now, as many of you know, the event started with a freak winter storm. We had snow and ice and below freezing temperatures, which for Texas is a very, very rare once in a lifetime type of scenario. In response, many Texans cranked up the heat in their homes. And because Texans are not used to extreme cold winters, many of them had electric heat pumps as their only heat source. Meaning that when they cranked the thermostat on their heater, the amount of electricity demand in the house goes way, way up. Now, that led to an inadequate available supply uh, of electricity that the grid could deliver to customers. Now, the way this is supposed to work is that when demand increases, supply can increase to meet that gap, especially if you're looking at abundant fuel sources like natural gas, which by the way is Texas's primary uh, energy source is natural gas, as well as there's some nuclear, some came from wind power, but less than 5% came from the solar farms. Although it was widely reported that the solar panels had failed Texas, Texas gets less than 5% of its energy uh, from solar power source. So the question is, why couldn't the nuclear and the natural gas power plants keep up with the increase in demand? And the answer is because those systems were not winterized. Uh, specifically, in the case of the natural gas plants, the gas lines themselves were frozen. They were frozen at the well, they were frozen in distribution. And so the power plants themselves, although they had excess uh, uh, combustion capacity to be able to provide more power, if the fuel source could not be delivered, then they're not going to be able to provide the, the power that's being demanded by consumers. So there was a major failure there. On the nuclear side, nuclear power plants require pumping large volumes of water to keep the reactors cool. Of course, with water pipes frozen and jammed up, or in burst in many cases, they didn't have the necessary water flow to be able to fire up additional nuclear reactor capacity. So you can see how this initial event is now starting to cascade into secondary and tertiary effects, which led to a complete breakdown. Now, the other thing that was affected was just your basic local travel and logistics. You know, Texans are not used to dealing with snow and ice on the roads, so in those type of conditions, combined with below freezing temperatures, so that snow and ice is not melting anytime soon, left many Texans forced to shelter in place. They weren't necessarily able to go out to travel to work, or more importantly, to buy food and supplies and fuel for their family. Okay, so you've got now millions of people stuck at home, a dwindling food supply, electric power grid that's overloaded. So the utility had to implement rolling blackouts. To prevent a total grid failure, they had to do rolling blackouts, meaning, they allow power on in certain areas for a certain part of the time, then they shut that area down and move to another district to help balance out the supply and demand um, equilibrium. Now, the problem with that though is this. 
For those Texans that did have access to alternate fuels for heating, like natural gas, for example, even if they had electricity turned on in their house, in many cases, they still couldn't run their furnaces to heat the home because the natural gas lines were still frozen up or broken. And so that meant that even if you did have electricity to run your air handler to, to blow the hot air or circulate hot air in the house, you still didn't have access to the, the actual fuel source for your heat if you were dependent on natural gas. So another key takeaway here, when you're depending on public utilities for your water, sewer, and fuel source, you know, you're still, you, there's still that counterparty risk of, can the utility deliver the product to me during a time of crisis? And that brings me to another point, because the, the municipal water supply was affected as well, not just at the utility level, but also at the individual homeowner level. The municipal water treatment plants and water processing plants require electricity to operate. These systems also were not winterized. So what that did is it left in many cases, many Texans were without safe drinking water. And in some cases, they just had no water pressure because of the burst pipes and the inability to respond to that and to get those systems up and running properly again. So again, when you're depending on a, a municipal utility, you know, you have a counterparty risk there of can that utility operate and give me what I need during a time of crisis. So this is a question that we really need to take a look at because when we're looking at emergency preparedness, you know, one of the key takeaways of this whole thing is you want to eliminate counterparty risk whenever possible. Meaning that if you can be in a safe place and you can take physical custody for your energy generation, your energy storage, your water source, and your fuel source for heating and cooking, now you've gone a, a really a great long way into securing your self-sufficiency and survival. If you have, can take physical custody of all those different fuel and water sources that you need, energy sources, and you control it on your property, then you're gonna be a much, much better fighting position during the next crisis. And so that's why here at Solar Surge, you know, we help people take control of their energy generation and storage. So most of what we're doing is helping to provide a renewable energy battery backup system and sometimes generator backup as well for the home so that the homeowner can be secure in their energy needs. But that's often part of a larger overall strategy of how can you set the house up to be as self-sufficient as possible, not just with your energy, but also with your food, your water, your security, and so forth. Now, if this is something that you're interested in taking a look at for your home, first off, I want to get you a free copy of my book, Built to Survive, because it's, it's the story of how my wife and I built our home, the one I'm, I'm standing in today, how we built our home with the goal of being able to survive off the grid for up to one year should the need arise. And it goes way beyond just solar energy and solar equipment, but the type of fuel that we use, how we store that fuel, and the other uh, appliances and systems within the home. So I'll put a link down below where you can grab a free digital copy of the book. And then if you'd like to talk about really getting a plan in place for your household to meet not only your emergency power needs, but also to really set your house up to be able to survive a prolonged grid down event or a loss of infrastructure like what we experienced in Texas, then feel free to reach out to us on the website, which is linked below, or you can reach out to us on social media and we'd be happy to help you get a plan in place. Well, folks, I thank you for taking the time to watch today's video. As always, if you're getting good value from the content that we're putting out here, make sure you click on that like button and click on that subscribe button. And be sure to share the video directly with anybody else that you think will benefit from the information here. You know, we've got the videos now up on all the major platforms. We're on Rumble, we're on BitChute, uh, we're on YouTube, of course. And uh, really our goal is to help as many people as possible to become as self-sufficient as possible so that you're not dependent on the government to take care of you during the next crisis. Well, as always, folks, I'm Joe Ordia, encouraging you to get prepared and be empowered. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again soon.